right, I believe we are okay to go ahead and get started. So good morning again and welcome everyone to the home base meetups for April. Today is the school net day. And I believe we've got our home base manager, Dr. Rob Dietrich with us this morning to get us started. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad to have you with us. Um, this is going to be a very um, brief opening. I know everyone on this call knows what the home base uh, products are. So we're gonna, just gonna start moving forward. There's your opening slides and the sign in. Please remember to do that there. Next slide, please. And there are the real quick, uh, your webinar go-to slide there. One thing we have added that I do like to point out is the captions are now available. If you look on the lower left corner, you have the ability to add captions to our meetings, which I think will be very beneficial for those who need that. As well as if you have questions, please enter them by a QA. That's only panelists can see the questions. And if you wanna interact, please use the chat. Next slide, please. We all know that this is my favorite meeting. I think that this is a great time for us to work with the field, get out in the field and see. And we have something positive to tell you with that here momentarily. This is a great chance for you guys to collaborate, give us feedback and make sure we're moving in the right direction. And something just happened. There we go. Next slide. Sorry. No worries. There we go. And then there are the links. You have the link for today. Obviously, you're here. Tomorrow is powerschoolandlearning.com. You have Canvas on Thursday and Friday is Go Open. Please make sure you attend all of them, as I know many folks wear many hats in these districts. All right, next slide, please. The new bit of information is that next year, we are planning on going back out to the field. So as you can see, it looks like July and February, we're gonna do virtually. However, September, November, and May, we are planning on getting back out in the field and planning on going to back out to see you and visit you and have some really good positive discussion with you about how home base can improve uh, helping you in the classroom. So those are the dates, please mark them in your calendar. Next slide. There are the slide decks as they we go through the week to make sure that you get access to them. Please click here. By the end of the week, you'll have all of them handy. Uh, next slide, please. There's all our call signs, hashtags, tags, whatever you call them. There they are. So please feel free to log on, like us, use us, and please see our Did You Know uh, segments that we're doing on Facebook. Next slide, please. And there is the great team. And of course, today you get John Mayers is presenting this to you, who does a great job with SchoolNet as well as helping with PowerSchool um, training. So we appreciate all of you for being here today. And we are very appreciative of John and his work as well as SchoolNet's work with us to make sure you get a solid product. Thank you very much, John, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Dietrich. So I will go ahead and shift over to our SchoolNet slide deck. Um, the bit.ly is on the screen here. And I'll mention, thank you, James, for pointing out that that bit.ly was broken, but it is fixed now, so you should be able to get there. John, it, it's asking for access to get to it. Um, oh. I don't know if it's just me. I'm so yeah. sorry to bother you there. No, I'm sure I forgot to share it. Thank you so much. Yep, sure did. Sorry, everybody. Okay, now that bit.ly should be working and fixed for real this time. Um, please let me know if it's still giving you trouble. But I think we've got it now. Okay. Sweet. And I, I see some, it's working in the chat. So awesome. So now we will go ahead and dive in for real. My apologies. Um, of course, our WebEx slide, uh, as Dr. Tietrick mentioned, I will point out that captions are now available at the bottom left. You should have a little robot with a CC button next to it. So if you need captions, that is there for you. 
I'm sure we have met. I'm John Mars, your SchoolNet product manager and home base trainer here at DPI. Also joining me this morning, I have Catherine Simone from Pearson. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see or not see virtually you this morning. Uh, look forward to uh, our conversations today. Thank you very much. So on deck for today, we have some home base updates and some usage updates. Um, another little note about Transcend. Um, we are still looking for a few pilot participants for next year, so we will talk about that a little bit. Um, then we'll look at some EOI reporting and student notes, that kind of thing um, that can be done in SchoolNet. It's that time of year already. I can't quite believe it, but here we are. Um, we did hold some time for some networking. We'll do some breakout rooms um, that seemed to go well last time, so we will keep that for this time. Um, we'll go over the updates coming this summer in SchoolNet 23.0, um, and then we'll wrap up with a Q&A and maybe a quick summary of what happened in our breakout rooms at the end. So for home base updates, um, just a quick note that SchoolNet has now dropped support for Internet Explorer 11 um, due to Microsoft dropping that support back in August. Um, so Chrome, Edge, and Firefox browsers are supported if you are using Windows, um, and hopefully everyone is using one of those three. Um, and also another note is that Windows 8.1 is no longer officially supported. Um, but again, hopefully everybody has, has been able to shift to Windows 10. Um, you may have seen in the last few weeks as well that we re-released the math sets assessments. Um, we have re-released those for end of year administrations. So the name of the assessment now matches the grade level that the assessment is designed for. So you can kind of get your last sort of check on their mastery of those math standards before it gets into EOG time. Um, so those are out there for you. And we do still have our two self-paced courses in Nesis. Keeping it simple in SchoolNet is a quick introduction to SchoolNet, um, creating an assessment, looking at the results, that kind of thing. And we also now have collaboration in SchoolNet where we dive into the test co-authoring features and the ability to share and collaborate on item banks. So those are both out there in Nesis for you. And that bullet is also a link that will take you to the SchoolNet Google site where there is additional information about those. Or if you just want to see the video on YouTube, it is out there as well. As far as usage, just some quick number updates for you guys. I pulled these numbers this morning, so they should be pretty fresh. Um, our total number of assessment submissions, we are up to 8.7 million, um, almost 8.8. .8. It That is up by 2.6 million since we last met in February and is again about on par with what we would typically expect this time of year. Of those submissions, we have 73,000 recommended assessments. These are the state level assessments that we recommended out. Um, and those have been used by a total of 49 PSUs so far as of this morning. Breaking down those numbers just a little bit, um, we had 14,000, almost 15,000 submissions of the beginning of year and middle of year math sets. And we've already had almost 2,000 submissions of the end of year math sets. Um, so it looks like those have, have sort of taken off since they went, came out. Um, almost 5,000 submissions of released math and science EOGs. Um, and I'll mention that that released math science number has doubled since we last met in February. Um, and, oh, I forgot to mention the math sets numbers for BOI, MOI are up by 2,000 since February. Continuing on in CFE submissions, these are the released North Carolina final exams. Um, we are at almost 25,000 submissions, and that is up by 1,000 since we last met. Our Certica testlets for math has tripled since we last met in February. We're, we're getting close to 18,500. And our Certica Testlet ELA submissions, we are closing in on 9,000, and that number has quadrupled since February. 
So these assessments are very clearly popular in being used, and we fully intend to keep these out there as an offering for you in the future. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Catherine to talk a little bit about Transcend. Um, actually, John, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, um, who is the director for Transcend to share this morning. Um, Jeff. All right. Well, thank you, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Hogger. I am the director of uh, Transcend. Um, and I want to give you a little background about myself. I was previously the uh, assessment director for New Jersey, state of New Jersey for eight years. Um, and then I found this Transcend product to be very interesting. And a couple of years after I left the state of New Jersey, um, I found myself here uh, working on this Transcend uh, product. So I'm very pleased to um, talk about this with you, introduce it to you. I think you've already, um, you know, had some conversations about this, but um, you know, afterwards, um, I'd be more than happy to show you a demo and discuss further, um, uh, you know, to continue our discussion if you're interested. Next slide, please. So before I, I really get into transcend and you know assessments, I really want to be clear in terms of uh, assessment types, um, particularly in the district market. I I hear a lot about. Um, you know, formative assessments, diagnostic assessments, benchmark, interim, and, you know, these all sort of come together and, you know, <clears throat> they, they have different meanings to different people. And I think they've sort of lost um, exactly what they mean now. And so I just want to sort of level set folks in terms of, you know, the different kinds of assessments and, you know, how we describe um, the different assessments. The first one, is uh, a formative assessment and that I, I i view formative assessment more as a verb right it's an action it's it's the difference uh in the classroom of providing students the opportunity to show what they learn very quickly and rapidly so after a class session if you want to see what kind of previous knowledge they have you might give a pretest, or if you're in a you know, doing a lesson plan for two or three days and you want to uh, see where they're at in the middle, you may want to give them a little quiz or perhaps like after a lesson, you, you want to uh, provide the information. But this is really quick, rapid feedback uh, for instructors to see where students are. Um, and the idea here is that these different assessments uh, differ in two fashions, right? Granularity, like a formative diagnostic you know, diagnostic assessments are very granular, very specific to a certain amount. Interim, uh, a little bit larger. And summative, obviously, you know, it's a summary of, of uh, uh, performance here. The other thing is frequency, right? When you do a diagnostic or this formative assessment process, you're really assessing students quite quickly um, and many times to understand their level of learning. Interim assessments are, are less than summative, but more than formative, really, you know, three to four times a year. And then some summative obviously is at the end, right? It's the capstone of, you know, what everything students have learned and really understanding, um, um, you know, what, what, how they progressed on everything they've learned throughout the year. Interim assessments now, we know, you know, diagnostic formative really are granular, really trying to get instruction. Interim assessments or benchmarks, we call them, are really, you know, these these uh, these periodic assessments, um, you know, three to four times a year, really get an idea of, okay, you know, after students have learned, you know, X amount of standards, where are these students, you know, um, and how can we take that information and instruct, um, you know, our programming or, you know, make uh, decisions in instruction. So there are differences between these. I, I see these words interchangeably a lot, but they really have different meanings um, moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about transcend, we're really talking about an interim benchmark assessment. And there are four things here that really describe transcend, right? First is an intelligent blueprint. Really the idea that students are only tested on standards that they have learned. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but it's aligned to uh, your curriculum maps. The second thing is an item bank that's calibrated so we can uh, use uh, computer adaptive testing, right? And so that's the third point. We have a computer adaptive navigation. What that means is that students, when they take the assessment, the students will be tested on the same standards. However, depending upon how the student performs, 
if they get item right, the next item will be a little more difficult. If a student gets the item wrong, the item will be a little less difficult. So the, the path that students take is really dependent upon how they perform. And so not all students receive the same items. However, they're still being measured on the same standards. And then lastly, and probably the most important piece is the um, reporting, right? We have dynamic reports and we'll get into this that really provide the information quickly um, to um, teachers and administrators so they can turn around and use that information. All right, next slide, please. So when we talk about our item bank, we do have uh, a range of item types. Um, they're all machine scorable, obviously, since it's a CAT um, assessment. Um, but we, we measure them, uh, we have different item types to measure the standards differently. For instance, in math, you know, we may have a multiple choice item, um, you know, a typical one that has A, B, and C, and D. However, we also have item types where they have to drag and drop, they have to show on a graph, you know, where this number would be. We also have um, items where there's a, a question and there's just a, a, a blank spot where the students have to do the work and they have to put their answer in there. Um, we also use equation editor. So equation editor is, is a neat feature where there's a problem set up to the student and the student has to essentially in the equation editor set up an equation and that's how they get the item right. So although these are one point machine scorable items, there's different ways that we can um, measure the standards and it's not just your typical multiple choice test. Um, another aspect of our item bank, obviously, is they're reviewed, you know, internally by content specialists, editors, external reviews. You know, we have them aligned to the um, curriculum maps they have. But more importantly here is, you know, this year we did have, um, you know, Cumberland uh, did use our assessment um, this year. And we had educators review the item bank for that alignment. And so, you know, that's something we feel strongly about as well. Our item bank is a secure bank. So, you know, you can't go and use them, you know, um, whatever, or, or show them. However, we feel strongly that, you know, educators should uh, review the items, look at them and provide feedback on them. So, um, you know, that's something we've done and we've done a lot of work within North Carolina to get that alignment um, with the scope and sequence and curriculum maps um, together. Reading items are largely passage, passage based which means students read a passage and they answer items. However, we do have a few items that are not, um, that they'll see on the assessment. You know, they, they might get a little uh, sentence or two and then have to respond to that um, before they, they get a passage. And obviously, as I sort of described in number one here, um, the items are intended to be efficient, right? Really measuring the construct and that's how we get to the different item types. Next uh, slide, please. So when we talk about the intelligent blueprint, this is where um, the districts get to choose what standards they select and when they want to assess them. And this is what it looks like um, on the far left. We have for this example, um, math grade three assessment one, um, and then we have assessment two and assessment three. So what you would do is, is for the assessment one here, you would select the standards you want to assess on in term one and you would select them and they would turn dark purple so that's what the dark purple represents those are the standards selected to be on interim one the ones that are still white uh, non-colored they they are the ones that haven't been selected yet so if you go to assessment two you'll see that those that have been selected for assessment one turn light purple right so the ones that were in assessment one are now light purple in assessment two and the dark purple ones are the new standards that you want to focus in on. Now, what, one thing I do want to um, stress here is the idea of Transcend is that you want to um, uh, assess standards that have been taught, right? Um, one, one confusion sometimes is uh, districts want to only assess the standards that have been uh, mastered or students that have a, a, a big grasp on. And, and you know, obviously in interim one, in interim one that'd be, a lot fewer. It's really what they've been, uh, you know, instructed on. That's what we're measuring. And the reason why is because the transcend assessment has a cumulative framework, which means that those um, standards that were selected in interim one will be selected to be assessed in interim two. So, you know, that progress of looking to see, okay, well, in assessment one, this is how they performed. There will be some items that were on assessment one in assessment two 
and assessment three to measure those growth to see how students do within year growth. But as we see in assessment two, the dark purple ones are the stand the new standards that between um, assessment one and assessment two have been the focus. And then obviously, as you get to assessment three here, um, it's completely filled out and you have <laughs> measured all the standards that students were supposed to learn throughout the school year. And the the idea, just one quick note here, um, these this process here of selecting um, your ITB and creating these standards can be done at the beginning of the school year. If you already know what your scope and sequence or curriculum maps are in September or August, you can say, you know what, these are what we're going to test on. I'm going to select the blueprints. You can do it all at one time. You could set your test window and then you could be done with it for the year. As long, obviously, as you notify everyone when the test window is and make sure that you know people know when it is. In terms of setting it up, this is how you set it up. You just um, essentially pick the standards you want to test when and you can do it all in one setting um, depending upon how you know quickly you do it and how many grade levels and subject areas, obviously, um, you know, depend upon time, but you could probably you know, have all your assessments um, set up if you're three through five, you know, within an hour or so. Um, and you can do it, like I said, at the beginning of the year. All right, next slide, please. So one of the key features for Transcend is that it's integrated within SchoolNet. So you don't have to learn essentially a new platform um, or anything. It's just, uh, if you're familiar with SchoolNet, it just becomes a little button that says Transcend. You can click on it. That's where you create your ITVs intelligent uh, test blueprint and that's where you'll see the reports so everything is embedded within SchoolNet, so you don't have to learn a, a new system the students are tested on test nav just like um, other assessments within SchoolNet. so i think that's a quite an advantage you don't have to learn any new system so everything that um is, is this transcend is within SchoolNet, um, and we do have dynamic text to speech um, for math uh, for those students, and we have a whole range of accessibility and accommodation features um, uh, available in Transcend as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the reports, um, the reports are, you know, I think one of the most crucial pieces of information. Um, they're dynamic and friendly in nature, which means if you're at the district level, you can see um, you know, how students in 8th grade, all 8th grade performed on this assessment, you can just uh, click a button and you can see the performance of all 8th graders um, aggregated by school. So you can start looking at school performance and then you can just keep clicking down and get to the student level. Obviously, there's a hierarchy. So at the district level, you can go all the way to the student level at the school level. You can go to the student level and then obviously at the teacher level. You know, you get to the student level, so they're online dynamic, um, you know, you can sort filter, you can drill down, like I said, and more importantly, these reports are, are available to educators within 24 hours and most likely um, in most instances, um, they're available the same day when the student finishes a few hours later, they are available. Um, we say within 24 hours, because sometimes it takes um, that long for it to be populated, um, but in most cases, it's within the same day. Next slide, please. And obviously we have reports uh, designed for specific audiences. We have a student report. Um, we have session report. Um, the session report lists, uh, you know, all the students within a classroom. Uh, teachers can get that view. They can sort based on their overall um, scale score, their domain uh, uh, scale score, um, their performance level, uh, predicted performance level. Um, their school and district overview reports that we talked about that um, <laughs> show uh, the performance of, you know, how your overall eighth graders or seventh graders, sixth graders would perform. Um, it shows growth. You can, as you go from interim one, two, and three, you can click and you can see the performance of um, all interims um, for, for that school or the district. So you have a lot of different availability here. Um, one thing that we are working on is as an interim, you know, the granularity that we talked about is a little bit greater than a diagnostic um, assessment or, you know, those formative assessments. And right now we have the overall scale score and we have domain um, scale scores. So how students did on operations and algebraic thinking and, and 
um, those. Now, one thing that we've heard is that, you know, they want to go down a level, you know, let's, how did students perform on standards? And so right now we are developing a report. So on the student report, you see the overall math score and the idea is you can click on it and then you can see the student performance um, by item. So you'll see if the, you know, they have all the items by standard and difficulty and if the student got it right or wrong. So then you'll be able to filter based on the standards, you know, the number of items students got for each standard, or you can filter on the difficulty and you'll see how those students perform. So um, it's a little more granularity. I think it's a little more information and it seems to be something that um, educators ask for. So um, that's in the pipeline for next year. Um, like I said, um, I think that's the end of my presentation, but if you have any questions or would want a demo, um, feel free to reach out and uh, I'm available to do that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so, like you said, if you do have any questions for Jeff or Catherine or I about Transcend, please feel free to reach out. Um, we do, like I said, have just a couple spots open for a free pilot of Transcend this upcoming school year. Um, I know I've sent some information to a few of you. So, again, as you are thinking about options for next year, if there is any info I can provide or if you'd like to move forward, just let us know. So, I think we next have a question, up, John. Oh, Sorry. yes. Um, James is asking Is there additional cost to pilot? And is there additional cost following the pilot period? Jeff, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Um, from my understanding, um, next year that there is availability for uh, two districts to pilot for free. And then in the following year, um, you know, if districts want to continue on, it would be $4 uh, per student. That is correct. Yes. Um, and I believe we have one spot for a charter as well, in addition to yes, those yes, two. Districts. I'm sorry. Yes, I forgot. No worries. <laughs> so, if there are any charter people out there interested, please let us know. All right. So, I think we are good to move ahead. So, this is one of our two training topics for today, um, but we wanted to run through sort of some thoughts around end of year reporting and student notes um, for going into next year. So I will turn it back over to Catherine for this section. Thanks, John. Uh, and thank you, Jeff, for the Transcend presentation. Um, so as John was mentioning, uh, we are probably close to six weeks out, you know, in the end of the year. Um, we've still, this year has still probably had a lot of transitions. Uh, maybe some of your students were remote or maybe you were in person. Um, but one of the um, terms that I've been reading about um, in education across the nation is unfinished learning as it relates to um, re remote learning, et cetera. And um, although we've shown you in the past couple of meetups uh, this year, uh, the different types of reporting and the new features in reporting, we thought that we could put a storyline uh, to some of them uh, to help you with some of your end of year tasks and maybe planning for summer school or for instruction next year. Um, so as we review some of these reports, um, we want to look at uh, maybe areas of unfinished learning by grade level, subject, or standard. Um, and of course, uh, depending on your role and permissions, you may be looking at this information at the district level, at the school level, uh, maybe for curriculum purposes to adjust curriculum for next year or to instruct, um, to adjust pacing um, for instruction at the end of this year or possibly for uh, looking at details of individual students um, as a teacher or a coach to support instruction for the remainder of this year, planning for summer school, or even for placement at the beginning of next year. Um, I did notice um, in the reporting dashboard, uh, we have several districts that are, um, have end of year assessments scheduled 
or pre-screeners for next year, uh, possibly placement tests for next year. Um, so we'll look at some storylines on how we can use the reporting data to look at those. And of course, um, you know, drilling into the standards and looking at um, instructional materials that are associated with the standards we've tested on for instruction. And then finally, um, a place we had spoken about this over the summer or last spring, um, recording narrative information based on students' strengths um, and relaying that information to uh, next year's teachers. Uh, maybe the student is transferring or they're definitely moving to another grade um, and providing some kind of baseline information to help um, at the beginning of next year. Uh, next slide, John. And because this is just an overview um, of some of the reports, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat or in the Q&A so that um, you know, we can address any specific questions to any reports. Um, so the last time we did a, a, a deep dive review of the comparison reports, um, but we wanted to just remind you that you can pull up uh, multiple uh, assessments and look at the scores for those assessments so that you can identify maybe at the district level or school level curriculum gaps um, in comparison of multiple assessments across time and adjust pacing at the end of this year if need be or planning for summer school instruction where we see some uh, places that maybe students have uh, larger uh, gaps or unfinished learning. Um, so again, this is accessible from the reporting dashboard. Uh, you select by checkbox uh, the num any number of assessments that you're comparing. You can choose to look at them by average score, raw score, students proficient or score group, and you select the check boxes across the top uh, there and click compare report. And from there, if you're district level, you can drill down into schools, teachers, sections, and or students from here. Um, next slide, John. Thanks. Um, using the same uh, screen uh, with the comparison report, you can toggle between the performance on this, the assessments that you've selected or the standards. Um, by using the standards, um, we're going to get a more focused view of in uh, previous instruction and how the students have performed and where we need to um, hone in and focus our instruction maybe for the next six weeks or plan for summer school instruction or even for um, remediation at the beginning of next year if needed. So just a reminder in this report, what you're looking at is across the bottom, the colorful uh, bar graph, you are seeing, um, this is, happens to be a math test that I've chosen, but you're seeing the math domains and you're seeing performance. Each color is a separate assessment. Um, so we can look across and see if the growth has, if there is growth, if there is a lack of growth, or um, uh, even drill deeper into these standards, if there are tier two or tier three level standards. So you can really get specific with your instruction um, based on this report. And again, um, you can leave it at the district, depending on your permission, school level, or um, the individual student reports. One thing I want to mention at this point, um, for the remainder of this school year, 2021, we are looking at um, the assessment date. Please remember that once we do the rollover, if you want to go back to these reports, um, they're still available in the summertime, but in the reporting dashboard, you would need to change the year, um, the enrollment to all students. 
so that you can capture the 2021 students after the rollover um, because you wouldn't have data on these tests once the rollover and now we're in the 21-22 school year. So just a reminder of that feature in the reporting dashboard to make sure that you're changing um, the enrollment um, and the year. Okay. Uh, next slide, John. Please. Thank you. So last time we had shown you this new report with the last upgrade, and I just wanted to give you a reminder on this that uh, the student analysis report, also available from the reporting dashboard, is a great tool to help you in grouping students based on their performance on assessments. Um, this report, uh, again, district, school, student level, but when you drill down to the student level, you have the ability to sort um, the report just like a spreadsheet on a number of different features. Um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide to take a look at that, John. Um, on, you'll see here on the top right screenshot, I've boxed out that you can hide or show specific columns. So if you're not interested in the raw score, you can deselect that. That column would be removed from your report. If you only want to focus on a specific subgroup, you can select that from the drop down, and then the report will condense and only show you a specific subgroup. Um, you can always, any of these reports that we're talking about for your end of your planning or instruction for summer school, et cetera, you can always export these. And you see on the second screenshot, um, I have it outlined in red there, um, export data from this particular report, you actually get two options. You can export the entire report so you can sort it um, all the data in Excel, or you can pre-select your parameters. Um, if you're only looking at um, students in a specific score group, then you can export that uh, data if you choose. I know there's a lot of districts that like to work in the spreadsheets that where they, they use the reports within SchoolNet and then they export the data so that they can manipulate it and then transfer it um, to teachers in another format. But this would be a great way to um, create your instructional um, sections, groups, classes, be it for the end of the school year, um, summer school, or again, planning for the beginning of next year. So if you're doing some of those placement tests, this might be a report that you can um, pull in to uh, help you with determining um, student levels and um, what would work best for instruction moving on. I have one more uh, slide on the next slide um, that is going to show you uh, a little bit more detail. Just a reminder on um, the top screenshot, maybe I'm only looking at students between 70% and 100% for one group. Um, so I can select that, filter it, and now I have my group ready made there. Or if I'm sorting by score group, I can select my score group and determine my groups there. Um, so again, thinking about how you can tie in all the um, reporting features in the dashboard uh, in SchoolNet to um, facilitate some of your end of year, summer, or uh, planning for next year. On the next slide, um, focusing on possibly remainder of instruction here or summer school instruction. Uh, this is an older report, but it's a good one. It's still one of my favorites. Um, if I'm looking at an assessment and I drill into a specific standard, um, I can uh, run the standards mastery report from the dashboard. And when I look at the standards mastery report, I immediately get a list of my students grouped based on a particular standard that I want to um, uh, focus my instruction on. And, and you see the bottom screenshot there, I have basically five groups of students, one group with only one student in it, 
But again, this came from training, so the data is a little bit different than what it would look like in production. But now, um, this bottom screenshot is focused on the North Carolina fifth grade MBT uh, 5 standard in math. And I have my groups um, from any point um, in the uh, reports, there's always this little icon here on the left top screenshot that is for uh, materials. Thanks, John, for putting the cursor on that for me. Um, when you click on that, I can get to another section of SchoolNet that's going to give me some options for instruction. And we're going to take a look at that on the next slide. When you click that little uh, icon, you get basically a grid table of the standards. So I, as I said, we're in the math, we're in MBT um, 5, and it will highlight the standard that you were just focused on previously in the standards mastery report. And North Carolina has a wealth of materials. If you look under the resource column, which is the second from the right there, um, you'll see that I've outlined, I put a red box around, there's 50 resource materials for that particular standard. When I click on that 50, it's blue, it's a link, um, you get the pop-up screen in the next screen where it actually has links to those materials within SchoolNet. So here, if you're planning again for any of those instructional needs that we've been discussing, you can go to the resources and um, you have materials uh, ready at hand to um, plan for instruction. Before I go into the next screen, are there any questions about um, some of these uses of the reports that we've gone through? Um, I know this is not an in-depth click path because these are reports that have been existing in the system, but uh, they're definitely ones that are available and um, you know maybe we haven't used in a while, so we just wanna revisit them at the end of this year, okay? Great, right, I'll take that as a no questions. On the next slide, um, we had discussed this um, possibly in the meetup at this time last year. Um, because of the remote learning, uh, it was difficult to determine for multiple reasons, um, possible strengths and weaknesses for students and in preparing for the next year's instruction. So your teachers, actually anyone with permission to the student, has the ability to go to a student profile and under the learning plan and teacher notes, we can input narratives. Um, there are three custom boxes there. Um, one is um, discussing the, the first one is a parent log. So if there were any communications with parents that were uh, notable um, for this student, the academic strengths, and then student behavioral strengths and opportunities for improvement. So here, by clicking on that add new uh, button, it's a gray button there, um, you're basically inputting a narrative. This moves with the student. Um, the data is not collected anyplace else except for in this tab, just a reminder. Um, it's not visible to the student. It's just for teachers and leadership with access to the student. Um, so here you can input um, specific information that may be helpful to next year's teacher, um, administrators when the child moves from your class um, or possibly from your school. Um, the filter where it says year. Um, so next year, um, it'll say 21-22 and we can drop back to 2021 to view any information that may have been included on a specific student this year. Um, there are also strategies at the bottom that can be used. Um, there's math intervention. Um, it's a checklist that teachers can select um, for things that they may have included this year um, in instruction. 
All right, so that's just a brief overview of different ways that you can use the reporting and notes features in SchoolNet um, for the end of this school year. Awesome. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I know in my mind, I love this teacher notes tab. Um, just a very easy way to pass a note about a student on to the teacher next year. Um, so with that, that brings us into our networking section. Um, and I think we've got enough people here that we can successfully do some breakout rooms. Um, so just like last time, we have these two topics that we, we thought were worth discussing with you guys in some breakout rooms. Um, so room one will be a year in review. How did the school year go in terms of school net? Um, is there anything NCDPI or Pearson can do to further enrich your school net implementation? And then room two will be looking ahead. What will next year look like in your school or district? What types of PD or other supports can we add? What types of state assessments would be useful? Um, you know, maybe even if you're thinking about transcend for next year, if you wanted to talk about that. Um, so we'll take, oh, let's say about 10 minutes, we'll come back into the main room at 11 o'clock. Um, and I do want to remind you that breakout rooms are not recorded. This main session is recorded, but the breakouts are not recorded. So please feel free to tell us what you really think. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and start the breakout sessions. So when I hit start, you should have a new breakout sessions button pop up at the bottom of your WebEx screen. And clicking that should show you a list of rooms that you are free to select from and join. And then I will sort of summon everyone back at 11 to come back and look at the new stuff in SchoolNet 23.0. Okay, so I believe we should have everyone back from breakouts. Um, and we will hold some time kind of at the end to sort of touch base on on anything from those that wasn't answered or needs to be answered or you guys just want to discuss in the larger group. Um, but next up, we wanted to go ahead and show you some of the cool new stuff coming in SchoolNet version 23.0. That will be this summer's release. Um, I'm pretty excited for you guys to see it. Um, I think that these are some awesome, awesome usability updates. Um, and so I will turn it over to Catherine to take it away. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, the features that I want to share today um, uh, are around the test details page, um, test ID and online passcode visibility, and the item search features. Um, currently, uh, next slide, in the test details page, this is a screenshot of what you're seeing now. Um, all the navigation is basically on the left side. Um, you click on the arrows to drop down and find the information that you're looking for. Um, and you move the test forward across the top in stages um, with the blue button. What is coming in 23.0 um, in July, you will see on the next slide, is a different completely different view of the test detail page. Um, next slide, please, John. Thank you. Um, so this is an example of a school level assessment, and this is the new look of the test detail page. Um, it's been redesigned um, so that the accessibility of the features is um, clearly more visible and you are not searching. Um, I get a lot of questions. Where's that? Where's that? And, um, hopefully this will make it a lot easier for the end user. The functionality is still there. There are some additional features in the functionality, but you are going to see, um, hopefully that it's a little easier to use. Um, so when you're in the test detail page, this top section where it says my English test um, is called the test banner. And we are going to see right away, you are seeing the level, the category of the test, which normally would have been hidden under test properties. 
you see the subject, the grade level, the stage that the test is in, who it's created by, and also when the test was last updated. This is going to come in handy because if this test were in the make public stage, you see that right across from last updated, a school level assessment could be, um, I could maybe be working on the first 10 questions and then a colleague of mine may be reviewing, um, may adjust a few things, but this way you're easily able to see in a public test um, when it was updated. You still, teachers still have the feature of co-authoring there, um, but it's it's a lot clearer who, when, Things are happening with this test. On the next slide, um, we'll break it down a little bit further. And I've separated out the views between the top is a My Classroom test and the bottom is a school assessment. Um, again, you have the edit um, at the top. You can edit the assessment name. Um, it's a separate link this time. Before you would have to open up the test properties, you'd have to edit. You'd have the drop down of all the different features. Now they're kind of separated out. So if you're just focusing on changing the test name while it's in this draft stage, you can do that here. Um, you can change the accessibility options from private to co-author on the bottom test, which was the school level assessment or district, um, whichever the case may be, you can change it from private to public or to co-author. Um, Clearly, if there are any warnings on this test, you're going to see those um, at the bottom. You see that in the second screenshot. And one notable change is what used to be called the ready to schedule is now called um, finalized. If there are warnings that it, the finalized button is going to be grayed out, um, as you know, you could not advance a test if there were warnings. So still same case here. Um, on the next slide, when you are in the process of creating the test um, below the test banner, this is the screen, be it, same page just below. I couldn't fit everything on the slide deck. Um, you have four tabs. You have the item summary, the item details, assessment settings, and downloads and resources. Again, these were all on the left hand side and they were hidden under those drop down menus. So um, if I'm in the item summary, I'm getting a clear view of the standards for this test. Um, you remember if you're using the standards template, that would have been underneath one of the arrows on the left. Now you're seeing those standards. Um, clearly at the top, and you can add or um, change um, standards for this particular test if you want to. Um, number of items currently in the test in the top right, the total points so far, and then we have um, a overview of the questions. So the first question is true, false. Um, true, false, multiple choice, the primary standard alignment, the total points, the correct response, authored difficulty, um, and then a, the drop down where you can click in edit, view, preview as a student, um, each individual item. Um, if you recall, in order to see these details of a particular item, the standard, the points, the correct response, the authored diff difficulty, you would have to click into the item or click the drop down, click details, view, and navigate to a couple screens out before you would get all this specific information on an item. Um, the up and down arrows for each column for the standard or the author difficulty allow you to sort. And right from here, um, you see the green bar next to the item numbers you can change the order of your items from there. Um, you can customize the item numbers at the top, change, customize the answer choices. Those were all the properties um, that you saw under item properties. Um, so hopefully again, um, a little a couple time-saving features there when you're creating. 
a more um, in-depth view in the item details on the next slide, when you click on one of those items, this is that first true false question. Now you're seeing um, the content, the answer choices, still seeing the points, um, the level of difficulty, um, but just more specific. And here is where you are able to edit um, the actual item under the item details. On the next tab, um, the assessment settings, um, oops, this was probably, some of these were at the bottom on the left. Um, so restrictions, um, you can edit the restrictions, um, set any accommodations. Now it's in one screen um, and you can set each individually. A lot of times um, I would get a question about, um, you know, resetting score groups. Um, so that all of this is going to be under the assessment settings um, and a little bit more avail availability. Um, did we have a question in the chat? Sorry, any chance? Uh, any chance district admins can view my classroom tests in the future? Um, view or ed? You mean search for Lindsay? I'm sorry. Just to be clarity. able to to be able to see them, like you can search you well, and you don't get to see them. Like a lot of times they have if they have problems or issues, and we try to pull it up to help them figure out the issue. We can't see it. Okay. I have access. To um, I have not heard of that. It's definitely not in twenty three O, but I will definitely add it um, to the ideas list. Um, to, um, by leadership, right? Sorry, I'm writing as I'm talking to you. Good point. Thank you. Um, Lindsay, I just saw that one. The, um, here's also on this screen with the assessment settings, you have the default settings. All of this can be adjusted, um, from this particular, um, assessment settings on the next tab over is the downloads and resources. Um, if you're printing, you're using, um, you need the answer key. You want to add a resource to the particular test, um, notes for the teacher. Those can be all included under this tab. Um, and again, these last four slides are all the actual creation portion of the items and the test itself, okay? Um, on the next slide, um, as you move the test forward in the stages, so the top one, um, the My Classroom test, um, we've moved it to the finalized stage, and now the screen is going to have uh, some different features. Rather than editing the items, you no longer have that item details, but you can go back and you have that Modify Items uh, button. And of course, the blue button to then move forward to schedule the test. Um, you still in the scheduled stage, you're going to then see the passcode. You still have the ability for the answer sheets. One piece I really like in this scheduled screen is that I am readily seeing, I do not need to open the schedule settings. Um, on the left-hand side, it's there. I can see the start date, the end date, the score date, and the assignments without drilling any further into it. Um, and I can edit if necessary from this screen. Um, on the next one, when the test is in progress, again, we're going to see a little, a few different features. Um, so each screen is adjusted based on the stage of the test. Um, if you need to scan the answer sheets, the score button is prominent there um, before it was hidden under test actions. The other piece I like is the assessment collection. So I already know um, how many, without any clicks, I'm able to see how many students have started the test. I can go to the data collection report and easy accessibility to the proctor dashboard. Um, also, when the test is completed in that final screenshot, 
Remember, we always get that reminder to copy the test um, for the next. But now there's also a link. Um, so it's completed. I can go back and view the proctor dashboard, that bottom red box there, and I can go right to the results summary. So if I'm in the test detail page and I click view results summary, it's going to take me right to the dashboard for this, the reporting dashboard for this test. So, um, more of, um. A circular navigation that's taking you right back to the reporting features without having to drop out to the main screen and go to that piece. Um, so I'm, I've probably mentioned this already on the last slide, uh, but again, each view changes um, the default view changes with the stage that the tests in um, viewing the results summary. Um, when you're back to the test details, um, you can obviously edit any of the features right from this screen. And hopefully that's going to make it um, a little bit easier um, to process your test creation. Any questions about that? All right, the next feature, um, and this is this is a small one, but um, a lot of times we get question uh, if someone has a problem with the test, we're asking uh, what's the test ID, um, et cetera. And sometimes it's if you're not in the test detail page, it's a little bit difficult to locate. So we've added um, three places where you can locate the test ID and also the online passcode, um, obviously in Test Central. Um, you can search um, and the ID, the name, the ID, and the passcode appear. Um, for leadership, it will appear on the assessment dashboard. Um, and for the teacher, we'll also see it um, in the assessment dashboard under their active test, benchmark test, or classroom test. Um, so you're a little bit clearer on the dates. Um, that bottom view is from a teacher's perspective there. So you get a clearer view of that. The, the final feature I'm going to share today has to do with item searches. And um, we were actually talking about um, items and release of items a um, little bit in the breakout room, but um, each time we upload new uh, content for North Carolina, um, be it uh, release items or classroom items, we always provide a date under which the um, items were, a date range for which the items were uploaded into production and training. And that little search was hidden under the advanced features. So you would have to go to filters and then advance filters and click into that. So now when you're using the filter feature, um, in the item banks, um, you're familiar with the keyword, all words, no words, you can search by the publisher, but you can now search by the date added and the date modified. So if there have been modified um, items um, or they've been updated, um, for instance, uh, we had, correct me if I'm wrong, John, we had two third grade math set items that were corrected within the last month. Um, yes. and the, yeah, and the dates would show here that we corrected those two items. And I believe we had one passage for ELA um, in the release items that we corrected in the last month. So um, you can search by date ranges here um, just to make that a little bit easier for you. Um, there are a couple other features that we will share with you in September. Um, when we meet up, or is it August we meet up again? Sorry, I wrote down the dates. I guess it's July. July we have meetups uh, again. So um, we can share those in the live site for you. Um, and uh, coming this summer, coming soon. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I love this new test details page. I'm very excited to see it. Uh, get added to our training site and see production roll over to it. Um, I think it'll make things a lot easier. So that brings us to our last little segment.
um, which is networking and Q&A. And I see a greatly, perfectly timed question um, from Sherry. When will these new features be added to the training site or when will the training site be upgraded to version 23? Um, I believe that's coming very soon. I forget the exact. Catherine, do you know the timeline um, on? We we should have training updated by the end of May. It's a little okay. later this year, Sherry. I do know that. Um, due to some of the other additional features that we'll be sharing this summer, um, the upgrade for the DCT sites, which include training, um, has been delayed. Um, probably two weeks off of what we're, we normally are at for upgrade. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and I see we have one coming in from James. Would we be willing to consider a quick YouTube video of these changes that we could share with the more experienced teachers next year to help them get the updates and expectations uh, that would help us without having to do an entire PD? Um, and I think that is definitely something that we can put together, James, um, sort of a, a quick at a glance. This is what's new. Um, and then, of course, we'll have the updated self-paced courses for teachers and users that, that need a little bit more information or want to earn a CEU off of it. Um, and I see one about any chance that we could add Desmos as the calculator tool instead of the one that's currently built into TestNav. Um, I don't know if that's something Pearson's looked at or considered, um, but we can take that back, certainly. Writing, right. John, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and I see some other folks agreeing that a, a, a quick drive-by sort of video about the new stuff in SchoolNet would be helpful. So we will make sure you get something. Um, I don't know if Pearson makes something like that anyway, um, but if not, I'm certainly happy to put something together for you, if nothing else. Thank you, John. I, I just wanted to chime in that, you know, some changes in SchoolNet that come through are, are cosmetic and don't really impact Features very much, but for people that use it a lot, this will be a pretty big change on that screen. And a short video will help make it more palatable rather than what they've changed it again. What did they do that for? Now I don't know what you know. It'll it'll be good PR if we could just have something to say. Here's a ten minute video. Show you everything you need to write your logo. Yeah, definitely it gives us that chance to say, hey, yes, it changed and it's better. We yep. promise. So I agree, James. Thank you for the input. Definitely. Um, so, and I, I'm reading over my notes from the breakout rooms. Um, and thank you, Cami, for capturing notes in the first room that I didn't make it to until the end. Um, so, and I know I heard this in the second breakout room, too, of folks liking the math sets um, and the other pre made, pre created assessments that we have out there this year. Um, and as I've said, we are working to make sure that that is something you can rely on being there every year. Um, so we certainly got some feedback about other types of assessments that we might be able to talk to NCDPI accountability about um, and some things that we can take back and talk to them with. Um, I see we did have some issues with like ending first semester and starting a new semester when those course enrollments conclude they no longer can go back and complete a test for that. Um, and that unfortunately is the case since SchoolNet is relying on PowerSchool for those course enrollments and to give those teachers permission to see those students and that data, it's got to have a course enrollment. Um, and I will go ahead and say, I know we talked about this in the second breakout room and it looks like it came up at least a little bit in the first. But unfortunately, since SchoolNet relies on PowerSchool for enrollment, if students aren't actively enrolled in a class in PowerSchool, they won't really be able to use SchoolNet. And that unfortunately is the case with summer school. Um, that's something that we hope to revisit. And I know we have some details coming out very soon around this. Um, but the answer is unfortunately no, SchoolNet will not be available for summer school this summer. Um, that's certainly something we want to revisit and continue looking at, but to get it done this summer just unfortunately was not doable. 
Um, so we will continue to look at that and see what other ideas we can come up with um, around using it for summer school and maybe even if there are any new thoughts or, or you know, ideas we can come up with around the end of semester issue because they're both really kind of the same issue. Right. Um, but I see that that would help someone mention credit recovery specifically. It would help with that. Um, so know that that is something that we are aware of and working on. Um, we just unfortunately don't have a way to do those things just yet. Um, and on that note, I saw we had a note about all of the state recommended assessments do have an end date of June 30th. Um, which lines up with the end of year rollover in school net. Um, so all of those in June 30, and then we should have new ones for you to pick up after that in the next year. Um, and I see we had a question on the math sets. If there's a way we can adjust the display to have, I believe, Lindsay, you wanted it to be checked that it would display on the students take a test widget. And as I recall, they were initially set up that way, and then a whole bunch of PSUs asked us to not set it up that way and go uncheck that box, if I'm remembering correctly. Catherine or Pam, you might remember. Right. So are you saying it's on now, Lindsay? We need to turn it off? It looks like for the EAYs, it's toggled on. Okay. I will look at that. Yes, definitely. And if it, if it was inadvertently left on, I will turn it off. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I see we have something from James and I see someone agrees with it, but I haven't read it yet. Um, <laughs> so with remote learning this year and into next year, um, since, you know, online schools out of the bag, it's not going back in. There are frequent requests from teachers and principals for, can you tell me what day and time a student took a test? Um, so down the road, could we look into a way to incorporate the start time and end time for individual students and individual tests? And I agree, and I see Catherine writing there. So hopefully that is yep. something. If we can't already do it, we can hopefully get that on a list and get that added. Um, but I agree that would be a great, great data point. You know, right now you can track and display student response time so you know how long but you don't necessarily know when they started and when they submitted that test. Correct. Okay, good. Yes, I agree, Pam. It's been a request for a while. So definitely, James, I would be surprised if that wasn't um, a popular request outside of North Carolina now, too. If it wasn't before, I'm sure it is now. Right. So. Um, you know, another issue that goes along with that is sometimes kids that are remote start a test that they don't submit, and therefore it's kind of hanging in especially when people integrate it through Canvas, you know, they might get a grade of what they did, or I, I don't know, there's a lot of weird things that can happen when they don't finish it, but if there was a start and end date, you, you'd have a pretty good idea that either they didn't hit submit or they just didn't do it completely. So there's there's more reasons besides just, you know, were they at home when they did it or at somebody's house or something like that, that would be helpful. Good use case, thanks, James. Definitely. So was there anyone from either of the breakout rooms that that maybe heard something or, you know, had a question we haven't discussed yet? Feel free to jump in the chat or unmute. Um, I have a couple. Can I share a couple things? Absolutely, Catherine. Thank you. OK, um, so as James mentioned, summer school elephant in the room request to use SchoolNet. Um, so I think that is a hot topic. Um, we talked about um, formative assessments. Um, John had mentioned about other um, types of assessments we could bring into SchoolNet um, in addition to 
the um, mass sets, et cetera. We had a brief discussion about the pathways and the copyright. Um, so we'll we'll look into other assessments that we could possibly bring in. Um, we also had a discussion around AP test. Um, and I think um, if any districts, um, the discussion is that AP items, um, in my experience, have been copyrighted. Um, but I relayed that what I have seen done in the past is an answer key only assessment that is um, created in SchoolNet that um, the students are given the paper copy of the questions because that is allowed um, according to AP um, to, in my experience and we wouldn't be violating copyright, but they're actually answering the questions in SchoolNet, which then gives us all the reporting capabilities um, and the, the student's response to the questions. Um, so that then triggered a request that um, in one of our next uh, meetups that we do an in-depth into uh, training on answer key only um review um and creating those and i had mentioned that john and i have been discussing that for the summer fall we were going to uh do an in-depth on um performance-based measures um so possibly we can tie those two together um in a training um performance-based measures being assessments that have uh, may possibly have ru rubrics aligned to items so that the music teacher, the gym teacher, the driver's ed teacher, uh, art, et cetera, can utilize SchoolNet and all the reporting features. And of course, we can then tie in the AP uh, classes. And maybe if someone wants to volunteer some information, we basically just need the answer sheet with the standard alignment um not necessarily the questions to create a sample in the training site for all of you so if you have one um feel free to send it to me or to john and we can um, work on a little pilot of that for you okay and if you have a performance-based measure that you're also interested in i know this is something that i'm working with the cte folks on so i do have a couple samples that i created for cte um, but if you have one for other courses um, that you want to share that we can put in the training site for people to look at and use it as an example, be happy to do that for you. Uh, just let us know. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and, you know, maybe that's something I can cover, too, in a future self-paced course in NESIS as well, um, so that that's just out there for anyone who might be interested outside of meetups. Um, but those sound like some great back to school topics. So, did anyone have anything else? Like I said, feel free to jump in the chat or unmute. Um, we are on the calendar until 12, so we are here for you. I will go ahead and advance to our last slide here, though. Um, as always, thank you for attending. And this is our home base team for the year. You can click any of those names to email those folks. And at the top right is the bit.ly for the feedback form from today's session. And as always, completing that feedback form will also fire off an email to you with a certificate for 0 0.1 DLC CEUs. So I will leave that up there for you and also pop that bit.ly into the chat. Um, and we will certainly continue to hang out here for a little bit. Anything has any anybody has anything they would like to discuss or have answered? Um, crazy ideas they have, anything. We're here. So let us know. And of course, if you don't have anything, thank you again for joining us today. I hope you have an awesome last month or two of your school year and an amazing summer. We will see you back for our start of school home base meetups kickoff, which I believe is at the end of July, if I remember correct. Mm -hmm.